one is going to be uh, Steve Peters. Very nice of you to uh, uh, forward that one and say, okay, anybody else gets gets bumped to February. But uh, we we do make special allowances for Steve Peters well, because he's first of all he's a creative genius. I think uh, I think we can both agree on that. Yeah, I actually, uh, his last Kickstarter, I, he was running out of gas and the Kickstarter might not make it, so he released a couple, he's got some blank sketch covers, and I bid on one in the past and I still haven't gotten it because he, he, COVID happened and, and all sorts of stuff, and it, it's fine, like, I'm, I'm not in any rush for Steve to rush this to me, you know, take your time, Steve, but I'm, he released more of them and I bought a second one. And he sent me a message going, oh, yeah, what cover do you want? And I haven't responded because I'm just thinking, what cover do I want him to do with his characters? And so it's, it's like every time I get a message from Steve about anything, I just feel guilty. Like, oh, yeah, I got to get back to Steve. I keep forgetting about Steve. But when Steve shows up, it's like this ray of sunshine because you're right. Steve is just great. Yes. Yes. It's... Uh, um and particularly uh, because he, he is talking about uh, music here, about writing a song. I hope that, uh, I don't know how you would sell it in this day and age because uh, music circulates um, a lot more freely even than, than, than comics and, and illustrations do. But uh, man, you know, the fact that, that you do, you can do a whole CD and draw the comics adaptation of it and it all came from the same guy that's uh that's just mind-boggling and i'm, I'm sure uh steve is is more than happy not to hear from you it's like as long as he doesn't hear from you as to what you want then he doesn't have to do it well i think he wants to hear from me to get it out of the way because he, you know, he wants to clear the deck for the next one right right well Different guys are different ways on that. I have to admit that uh, any kind of uh, obligation that I'm committed to, like the uh, the video for the Portuguese translation of Cerebus, uh still haven't heard heard back from uh, uh, from Brazil about uh, about that one. I don't know if that's because of the uh, uh, that Bolsonaro da Silva. Um, election was man you talk about red state versus blue state uh 51 percent to 49 percent that's got to be a very very tense country at this point and is probably affecting uh everybody's schedule and everybody's state of mind but so as long as i don't hear from them i don't have to do the video and i'm not i'm not behind on the video and uh I'm not too proud to admit that, that I'm that way and just about anybody who's who's doing uh, commission pieces uh, is that way at, at some level or another. So Steve writes, can you expound on the significance of Mungu Makono? Why you latched onto it initially? I'm assuming it was in Mary Hemingway's diary. Yes, it was and why it was that the phrase uh, became so significant to Cerebus later that it drove him batty for a while. Uh, I'm working on a new song. It was one of those things that just wrote itself, at least the music part of it. I spent some time figuring out what the theme would be, what it would be called, and again, it was one of those things where I knew if you wait long enough, it'll come to you. And the answer was Mongu Makono. So if you can give uh, any thoughts on that, uh, it might help me out with the lyrics. Um, I'm hoping that you can uh, just sort of put up some images from the whole uh, Mungu Makono uh, plane crash uh, sequence. And this was one of those, I mean, Steve is also a, uh, an extremely spiritual guy, um, has, is, in front, my frames of reference is probably a little closer to paganism than to monotheism, but uh, definitely intends to be a good monotheist. 
And I don't know, uh, none of us know how that works. Um, does, uh, how much does it count that you had uh, good intentions? We know what the road to hell is paid with. Uh, but that's, that's above all of our pay scales. It's, it's God that decides whose intentions were actually good and who was just hitting themselves, um, I assume. So because this starts going all over the place or has the potential to go all over the place and we're coming up on, uh, on the two hour mark, um, so trying to, trying to bring this in for a landing, I thought, okay, this is, this is one of those ones where I'm going to type out the answer. And uh, that's what I did uh, this afternoon. So, Mungu, Mungu Makono, God in the hand of God. It's a fusion, I infer, of primal African theology subsumed within Islam, like Allahu Akbar, God is greatest. Uh, this is the proper reaction of human beings to terrifying enormity, which the Hemingway's plane crash constitutes. In the face of terrifying enormity, call God to mind, out loud, vehemently, and with deference, humility, and subservience. Uh, I would assume someone among the Kenyan natives said it, and everyone else followed suit. To the Hemingways, that reaction was evidence of simple-mindedness and the inferiority of black Africans to New York City sophisticates like themselves. Superstition. Both of those are perception choices. The first, I infer good, and the second, I infer bad. It isn't, I infer, God's literal hand, but it is, I infer, the best illustration of the answer to the old canard Quote, is God sufficiently omnipotent to create a rock big enough that even he can't lift it? Unquote. Theoretically, as in I would theorize, that's what the physical universe is. God is omnipresent in spirit everywhere in the physical universe. The physical universe is more real to physically incarnated beings like us than God is. You have to knowingly and willfully connect your spirit to God's spirit, to connect with him. And most spirits will choose not to. Many are called, few are chosen. God constructed the universe in such a way that he can't elevate all of the spirits within it unless they connect on their side. Choosing God is your best choice, which brings us back to good choices and bad choices. The hand of God is a zero or one proposition where you make all the decisions. Ernest Hemingway's, reaction, Ernest Hemingway's reaction to the plane crash was to choose to get drunk and acquiesce in being surrounded by Hemingway's sycophants who followed suit. Getting drunk is the worst thing that you can do with a concussion. It's also the worst choice you can make in the face of terrifying enormity. But it's what Hemingway chose. Hemingway was over halfway between his first African safari and his self-inflicted death by suicidal shotgun blast. He had made a number of choices in his life, most of them bad. The first plane crash was, I infer, a warning which he ignored, which led to the second plane crash. The two plane crashes happening that close together, emphasizing the critical nation, nature of where he was in his lifespan. Incapable of making good choices, the badness of his first choice led to his second choice, and the badness of his second choice sealed his fate, the second choice being to also ignore the warning. He was irretrievable and irredeemable by his own choice. Winning the Nobel Prize for Literature was Ill irrelevant id stuff like lighting a sparkler while you're on the Titanic's foredeck as it's going down. He had, a, he had chosen a bad end, and a bad end he would have, both in this life and, I infer, in the next. I see reading scripture aloud as a signal beacon from an otherwise lost aircraft. You and I could discuss John's gospel 
Steve, and it's just gibble, gibble, gibble on both sides. But if you and I both read John Gos- John's Gospel aloud, then we're actually participating in the closest we have to God's actual presence in our world, the means by which God chose to reveal himself. Both our signal beacons are sending the same signal when we stick to Scripture. The idea isn't to understand it, I don't think. It's to send it. Participating in it causes you to make better choices. The better your choices, the fewer bad choices you make. David Birdsong has been reading John's Gospel aloud in its entirety every Sunday. I read it aloud in its entirety every Monday and Wednesday. Maybe someday I'll stop and he'll be the only one. Maybe someday he'll stop and I'll be the only one. Or maybe others will join us. Maybe others have already joined us. As I wrote to David, the important thing is to look at what you're choosing over John's Gospel. I know David was concerned about Christmas falling on a Sunday this year, breaking his streak. In our our society, the, to me, anti-religious temptation to gorge yourself on bad food is always there, along with excessive materialism. It's what Christmas is in our society. It's very tough to pull away from, speaking from 20 years of experience. Brittany getting married, and that being a surprise, would be a tough one for a dad. Not being a dad, I side with the Quran. Quote, your wealth and your children are only a temptation, unquote. I hope he managed to celebrate his only daughter's marriage, but I do think reading John's gospel aloud was the wiser choice if he had to make a choice between the two, faith and endurance. For my part, I fused my Sunday observance Uh, on Christmas, reading aloud 10 chapters from the Torah in the morning, 10 chapters from Revelation at midday, and the last two hours before midnight, the Quran, and my Christmas observance, reading four chapters from John's Gospel before each prayer time, and five before the last prayer time. And then three hours later, the entirety of John's Gospel, it being a Monday. Monday, Boxing Day, the furnace conked out. At the earliest I could get a repair person was Thursday. So no heat in the off-white house for four days. Which brings me to another aspect of Mungu Lakona. The Job rule is always in effect. With all of my strict religious observances, why was I being punished with no heat for four days? Never a valid question. If it's a punishment, you need to accept it and find redemption through the acceptance. If it's a test, you need to pass it. I hope I did. Quote, the fifth belongeth to God and the apostle, unquote, it says in the Quran. Likewise, quote, lend to God a goodly loan, and he will double it to you again and again, unquote. The origin of the zakah. Jacob vowed in the first book of Moshe, 28-22, to give the tenth to God the origin of tithing. I donate 20% of every dollar that comes into AV to the food bank of Waterloo Region. Accepting what I pay for groceries, I give as much money to panhandlers as I spend on myself. Monday and Wednesday, cookies and coffee and the Toronto Sun and Waterloo Region record. Uh, My subscription to the National Post and the Epoch Times. It's a win-win. It keeps me from spending excessive amounts of money on myself and ensures that some homeless person doesn't have to worry about food for a few hours. It's also, I infer, a good, quote, if everyone did this, the world would be a better place, unquote, theory. Just a theory, but it's my theory. Dialing your materialism down to five from 11 and dialing your charitableness up to five from zero. That's my perceived experience with the hand of God. Are these good choices? I'll find out on Judgment Day. What I did was to inject Cerebus into that Hemingway narrative. Cerebus is subject to the same hand of God construct. Bad choices lead to worse choices. He touches, touches religion obliquely in Rick's story and then 
makes the bad choice of Jaka over that religious sensibility. A bad choice option is always accompanied by a good choice option and a worse choice option. The dualistic on-ramps arrive simultaneously in our lives with just time enough to choose. Which is the snake and which is the ladder? Cerebus, choosing snakes over ladders repeatedly, sees Ham Ernestway as a reward instead of the warning that he is. As the two plane crashes are to Ham Ernestway, so Ham Ernestway's suicide is to Cerebus, a red flashing warning light. Ham Ernestway ignores his warning, and Cerebus ignores his warning, and they both end up the way they end up. The moral of the story is, quote, don't let this happen to you, unquote. Make better choices on a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute basis, because everything matters. Microcosm to macrocosm, and it's your soul that's at stake at every juncture. Mangu, Mangu Makono, God, in the hand of God. Good luck with your lyrics. You may not rock the house like the Pointer Sisters did with I'm So Excited. But any song grounded in Mangu Makono, I infer, has to be a better choice and a better use for a musician's talents than the daughters of an Oakland, California minister singing about a one night stand. Right. So there you go. We're under two hours, Matt. High five. Well, that's part of it is because, as I said on the blog, I, I did the strip and I and I put it up a, a week ago going, I don't know if we're going to be doing Please Hold, but if we are, this is the strip. And if you want to send questions, then go ahead and, like, Larry sent his in, and that was it. Everything else was stuff that I had found until Michael and Steve, and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, somebody remembered, oh, hey, it's the first of the month. <laughs> well, we, we, we keep going as long as, as long as we can keep going, and uh, the, time, the time definitely always flies by. I mean... So you, you have a good night. You too. And, uh, say... Say hi to Paula and the girls for me. Yeah, I actually have to rearrange their bedroom because they they sleep sleep on a bunk bed, but the big one wants her own room, so she's kicking her sister out. And now I have to build the loft bed we bought to put over the guest bed that the big one wants. And it's it's shuffling deck chairs in the Titanic of eventually these kids are leaving my house. I know that. I don't want them to leave today, but if they're going to continue to whine about who sleeps where, they can go. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, girls especially get to the age where, uh, no, my sister can't be here anymore. I, I love having daughters. The, the old adage that girls mature faster than boys is... I don't want to say mature, but the girls advance faster than boys, I fully believe. Both my kids, top of their class for reading and writing and arithmetic. I mean, you know, you know I went to Natasha's parent-teacher conference, and what the teacher said, and I told her this, is word for word what they said five years ago about her older sister. You know, th these kids are just smart as whips. Meanwhile, I know little boys that are about the same age, and the parents are worried about how developmentally, you know, they're they're lacking, and I'm thinking maybe it's just that girls, you know, get there faster, maybe it's that part of one of the big feathers in my cap is both my kids are excellent readers, they're, you know, they, the school now, the reading levels, instead of being like 1 through 5 or something like that, it's letters, so A is the basic, and it progresses from there, <laughs> Both kids are supposed to be, in, in first grade, you're supposed to be at like a, what was it, like an F or a G, and both my kids were like K's, 
L's. You know, what the, the problem they're running right. into is not that they can't read, it's that they can't read things at their reading level that are appropriate with the content. Right. And, right. and as the teachers say, it's a good problem to have, it's just really annoying because they only have two or three books that advanced in the classroom because kids aren't supposed to read that well. And what I think it is, is when Natasha, or when Janice was born, we were living in the, our apartment and getting the kid to go to sleep, you know, all parents know newborns, when they sleep, it is the best thing in the universe. You know, if you can make them fall asleep without any problems and they stay asleep, anything you do to maintain that state is the best thing ever. So, like, we're watching TV, but we have to turn the volume way down because we don't want to wake the baby. <clears throat> so we put the subtitles on. So we're watching TV with subtitles, we're watching movies, we watch it with subtitles. Well, we just got in the habit of leaving the subtitles on. So as the kid's growing up and we're watching, like, Sesame Street and child-appropriate shows... You know, they're hearing what Elmo's saying, but they're also seeing that there's words in the screen. And I think that... Right, I think, right, right. I think it was... in You know, it's... Because I was freaking out. How am I going to teach my kid to read? Like, like I've been reading for... I taught myself to read because I wanted to read Spider-Man comics. Like, what am I going to find that they want to read? And it turned out all I had to do was turn the subtitles on and walk away, and they'll figure it out. That's, that's good. That's... Uh, more people should be doing that. That's I, I advocate it every with both my kids' teachers. It's uh you should tell everybody put the subtitles on, because now my biggest problem is like we go to the in laws' house and they turn the TV on and it's crap. They're watching crap. It's reality TV show crap. <laughs> like the last time we were there, my mother in law, my mother in law is watching a show about customs in Australia. It's a TV show about. Customs officers dealing with foreigners coming into Australia, and you know they're kind of sketchy, and sometimes you know. And, and the part I, I, I'm what I'm I'm not watching it, but it's there type thing. You know, it's kind of like when you have a TV, and you know if the TV's there, it's distracting you. And yeah. and so like I'm not trying to watch this, but I'm watching it, and like the cu customer officer going, "Well, I don't want to be accused of profiling, but you fit our profile." And I'm thinking. How is this a TV show? Like, like this is a series. It's not just a, a one-hour special. It's 20 hours of television. Like, 20 hours of your life watching somebody do their job and, you know, finding drugs, not finding drugs. And I'm, uh, and, but when we're there, they don't have the subtitles on. So, like, I can't hear the TV if someone's being loud. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not interested, but what did they say? Yeah. <laughs> So it's like, yeah. if they hand me the remote and go, oh, you can put out whatever you want, I'm like, oh, the first thing I put on is the subtitles. Let's read a movie. Right. But, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's funny. Uh, uh, Nick and Kristen down, uh, down the street and their daughter, Nola, and uh, I saw, saw, them, saw them just before Christmas. And uh, uh, Nola... Uh, Nola, how, how old are you now? She goes, uh, I'm five. And she says, uh, my mom says I'm five going on 18. <laughs> and I said, uh, Nola, mom doesn't mean that in, right, in, in a good way. <laughs> Kristen says, we haven't had that conversation yet. <laughs> I'm going, oh, okay, time for me to get away from here. Don't, don't say things like that because as soon as I said, mom doesn't mean that in a good way, her face went like, Huh? What? I missed something here. And that's definitely what you're talking about. The, the five going on 18 and mm, you probably know more stuff than you should actually know. And you don't know a lot of stuff that, uh, that you're going to, you, you should, you should know. So, uh, well, you know good, good, good luck to all old, uh, parents of overachieving daughters. Well, this is really quick, and you'll love this one. So yesterday, we were watching one of the Star Wars movies, and Natasha s says to me, where did they film this? And I jokingly said, on location, in space. <laughs> because, 
that's that's the tag at the end of Hardware Wars was filmed on location in space. And I'm like, I just, you know, spit it out. It was a fun joke. She didn't think I was joking. She's like, wait, they filmed this in space? And I'm like, well, remember when we were at Disney? We went on that ride. They got us on the spaceship. And then we went up into the other spaceship. And then we came back down to the planet. And she's going, wait, that was real? And I'm like, of course it was. Why would it have been? And, and then, bad daddy. Bad daddy. And then, and, and Paula was there too. And she's looking at her like, what do you mean? Where did they film this? They filmed it. And I'm like, they filmed it in England, not a studio. You know, it's make-believe. Because whenever she asks me, is this a fiction? I'm like, well, usually when an, it's an animated talking dog, yeah, it's make-believe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and in the meantime, they've got, they're, they're absorbing like a sponge all of this stuff that they probably shouldn't be reading on the internet and talking to each other. Like, they, you're talking to their girlfriends where, you know, everything is allowed in some households. So they get to tell everybody stuff that, uh, no, it's, that's where the five going on. On eighteen thing comes in. Well, we, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Have, have a good night. We'll 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 revisit this. I'm sure multiple times in the next twenty years of my life until these girls stop talking to me. <laughs> That's right. Have a good night, Daddy. <laughs> you do, Dave. Bye bye. Bye.